Okay. Um, we are now looking at the transformation that took place across Europe between the 13th and the 16th century on social, economic and political fronts. And a lot of things did happen as you are seeing and as you will see. One is the enormous growth of manufacturing and trading that happened in Europe, in England, in Holland, um, in a large number of cities in Italy. There was a big growth of manufacture. There is a big growth of um, trading, export. So, big growth in economic activities in this period, not just in one spurt, but it happened through the 250 year period, right up to the middle of the 16th century. This was one major transformation. In contrast with the previous 6, 700 years, there was, when there was really hardly any growth impetus in the society, this was when things were beginning to happen. This is also the period, secondly, when the Americas were in the process of being discovered. You probably are aware of the fact that people were not looking to discover Americas. They did not know there were Americas at that time. But they were trying to find a sea route to India because they knew they knew that India, as it was called Indies, was a source of affluence. They found it from the writings of Marco Polo. They found it from the narratives of ever so many traders who went overland to trade with the Indies. They found that enormous fortunes could be made by trading with the Indies. So, with explicit approval from the monarchs of Europe, especially the monarchs of Spain and Portugal who were even willing to fund such explorative sea ventures. Serious activity was underway in trying to find the sea route to the Indies. There were a lot of people who thought that you could get around Europe by taking the north western route and then the north eastern route. A lot of them landed up simply in deep into the Arctic circle through ice flows and so forth and did not return. So, the northeastern route was quickly abandoned. And the other route was the western route when they said let us sail across the Atlantic and find the Indies. And that is the route which eventually led to the discovery of Americas. The earliest travelers from Spain who reached the American continent reached the West Indies, which is why it is called the West Indies. They thought they had got to India. And when they got to the mainland America, they thought they had gone to in, got to India proper and they called everybody Indian, which is why you heard things about American Indian, Red Indian and so on and so forth. So, exploration was a major activity which was going on, lot of information was coming into society and more importantly exploration meant its own growth impetus. It creates newer demands on the art of navigation, it creates newer demands on the process of sailing. The standard European sailing galley was converted substantially by the time 16th century came into a highly maneuverable ocean going vessel. This was a big transformation which later paid off its dividends through growing trade, ocean trade. Eventually they did find the sea route. They took the southern route. They went around down the coast of Africa, went all the way down to the tip, the Cape of Good Hope. It became a Cape of Good Hope because they turned around and they said, my God, things are changing, we will probably get to the Indies. They turned around, then hugged the coast of Africa and came up north, went past Zanzibar and went right across the Indian Ocean. They got to southern India. They landed up in Goa, Vasco da Gama. So, that was the successful route. And all these explorations meant growth of trade, growth of commerce and manufacture. Then once they went to America in the 14th and 15th centuries, particularly 
in the 14th in the 15th and 16th centuries there was growing influx of american gold from mexico and peru and the agents who brought it in were mainly spanish and this led to an enormous inflationary pressure in europe but most importantly when prices start going up there is a market for manufacture because people are induced to make more and sell because the prices are going their way. So, the influx of gold led to a tremendous expansionary pressure in the European market which led to more expansion of manufacture and business. Then of course, the inflationary pressure itself started creating fundamental imbalances in the society. As you know, whenever there is an inflation, when the ma value of money is declining, when the real worth of money is declining, anybody who has a fixed income suffers much more than people who have variable incomes. If you have an income which makes adjustment for the rate of inflation, then that is the best way to be. In fact, if you can make money out of inflation, that is even better, which is what speculative business does. But people who have a fixed income, some kind of an annuity or a pension or a salary, these people are very hard hit when inflation happens. Which is why in modern economies, in, in like India for instance, you have provision for something called the dearness allowance, which is an inflationary adjustment built into the salary structure. So anyway, Europe did not have it at that time, so which means there was fundamental alterations going on in society in terms of who was hit by inflation and who was not. And the people who were hit hardest were people with more or less stable incomes, people who are the aristocracy and the well to do clergy, all of whom had stable incomes from their land. But as the income from land came into their hands, to trade, they found that everything that the agricultural products could trade with was getting costlier and costlier. So, the value of their earnings in real terms and monetary terms too was relatively stable, but the value of what they needed which was in terms of non-agricultural produce was getting costlier and costlier. So, over a couple of hundred years, a large number of members of aristocracy at large number of members of well-to-do clergy. In, I am saying this because it is the aristocracy and the church which owned all the lands, you remember. So, large number of members of both groups became impoverished, became severely indebted and got into very severe financial crises. This is about impoverishment. Then there were the towns growing. The growth of towns were particularly impressive when there were also ports. Amsterdam was a tremendously dynamic place. A large number of financial innovations amper happened in the finance markets around Amsterdam at that time. Some kind of insurance, ocean going insurance started in Amsterdam some kind of a central banking that is a bank which would coordinate the bank behavior of other banks on private initiative started in Amsterdam. There was some kind of verification across Europe of the quality of coinage and money was also at foot and Florence became one of the most important financial centers at that time in Europe and the coin of Florence, the gold florin became the first truly accepted international money at that time. So, growth of towns, growth of cities, growth of ports was a very major factor and what is important is that growth of towns would mean growth of populations and growth of population definitely immediately adds to the productive capacity of towns, employment and so forth. I can give you a little break if you want to finish writing these things.
Yes. A major process of organization of manufacturing took place at this time. I have talked to you already about this when we were talking about factories. The putting out system. What the merchants used to do in the early part of this 200 years period which we are talking about 300 years what was they used to go out there to the artisans and craftsmen who manufactured goods and buy the goods from them and put them in storage and sell them or export them from storage. Gradually they found that they had much better control over the quality and quantity of goods that they received if they got into a direct arrangement with the manufacturers before they started manufacturing. So, they would go to an artisan and say well look I mean uh, I will give you an advance and I will give you these raw materials with which you can manufacture these goods and this is my quality specification of what I need why do not you make it for me which is everything good for the artisan because he not only gets everything organized for him but he also gets an advance so that he can he does not have to worry about his consumption needs straight away. So, this system of supplying the businessman I am sorry supplying the artisan or manufacturer with some advance for survival subsistence against orders reaching a contract about the order in terms of quantity and quality and other specifications supply of raw materials these whole thing these whole lot of things put together came to be called the putting out system. What was basically happening is the merchant was free from insecurities associated with the product market. His market was very secure he had control over both the quantity and quality of the product which he was going to get. In return for this he had to make advance of materials and money. So, it was very little different from making advances to acquire fresh inventory. Instead of buying goods in advance and storing them up you are actually paying the fellow to make them for you. So, it is a big movement from inventory management as a businessman to getting control over manufacture through the putting out system. The putting out system is the earliest form of capitalist manufacture and the earliest form of business capital was then the merchant capital. Merchant capital slowly started becoming manufacturing capital. By the middle of 16th century putting out system had made considerable advance across Europe particularly in Italy, in England and in Holland again and in France. The process of capital consolidating itself in the hands of both trading and manufacturing gained speed so that by middle of 16th century most of the production was taking place under the putting out system and this had its own consequences. The consequences were two one the capacity for the trader to expand business became immensely bigger because he could control the source. Second the control of the trader as a manufacturer made him much more knowledgeable not just as a trader in the good but as a person who knows now the technique of manufacture and who runs the process of manufacture. Towards the end of this period you find another change happening more and more of the craftsmen and artisans who were working through a putting out system with a businessman with a trader are now drawn into the factory system proper. 
the manufacturer trader now all has all that he has to do is to get a shed ready put the machinery and tools ready there and tell the artisans now why don't you guys come and sit and work here saves you a lot of trouble i'll bring you your raw material here i will supply whatever overheads you need to continue production and finally i am giving you the machinery and equipment which you don't have to spend on so in this process the putting out system becomes a factory system most important the artisan now becomes the industrial working class There were a couple of other things which I wanted to consider in the emergence of urban working class. Where did this working class come from? From what I have stated so far, it might appear to you that it came only from increasingly unemployed artisans and manufacturers. It is true. The guilds still regulated the activity of the artisans and manufacturers. but more and more of the guilds came into agreement with merchants who operated the putting out system and the early factories but in this process some of the artisans and manufacturers who were on the margin of the whole system either because they were not completely skilled or because they had uncertain relationship with the guild whatever reason they were on the margin they could not be absorbed fully into the putting out system they went out so a sizable part of the early urban working class came from artisans and manufacturers who are all small but who could not control their fate as it evolved in this world around them and gave up and became workers so a sizable proportion of the early urban working class came from urban areas itself but subsequently it was a push from rural areas which created urban working class increasingly in england and in other parts of europe agricultural labor was displaced from agriculture in england at least the main reason for this displacement of agricultural labor from agriculture was what was known as the enclosure movement have you heard of this can anybody take a shot at what what it means the enclosure movement no no the enclosure movement was in agricultural sector it created dramatic agrarian effects in the sense that it upset the agricultural society so much that a large section of the population got displaced from agriculture and became shiftless and started moving into the cities which is why i said it's a push from the countryside so what is this enclosure movement in england it's a very profound thing that started around the 14th century and went right through to the middle of the 18th century and gained momentum you see most english villages had an organization of land which meant there were open fields which were cultivated by the farmers then there were residential parts of the village where people lived either in their fields or as a cluster of residences and third they had what was called commons common areas for the village as a whole which had existed for long long time
you might have heard even these days expression called Wimbledon commons. It basically meant long long ago that Wimbledon was a village and the commons of the village was this piece where the tennis matches take place today. Anyway, so commons were common property of the village as a whole which was partly used for grazing the cattle of people in the village. Sometimes shrubs from the common property areas were cut for use as firewood. So, common property was a kind of a an externality of the older system. Are you aware of externality? What is it please? Avantika? Now, you are making it sound like a traffic accident. <laughs> No, I know what you mean. You are just saying that you know somebody else gets affected without. Can you give me an example of an externality? Pollution. Yeah, it's an externality. I run a factory. I, I my uh, uh, chimneys smoke and smoke and smoke, and the town gets dirtier and dirtier and maybe sicker and sicker. Yeah, externality certainly. Can you think of a good externality? Why should it all be nasty? Education is it an externality? And a positive externality? I am delighted to hear this. A positive environment. But that's not externality, that's part of business, no? It's within the internal economy of the factory. Fantastic, yeah. So, you are talking of external economies, which is what your theory talks about, no? Internal and external. Fine, I would accept that as an externality, yeah. So, we are talking about externality here in terms of commons. The existence of commons took care of a lot of requirement for externality in rural agriculture in England. But increasingly, what happened was well to do farmers in the area simply started putting a fence around the commons and started enclosing them. And few people could protest because they were well to do farmers. It was basically a capitalist takeover virtually agrarian capitalist takeover of rural England which happened over 2 300 years. At the end of this period most of the commons were enclosed and converted into private agricultural land. It is like encroachment. Only thing is here is an encroachment which you enclosed, you fenced off not to build your bungalow, but to grow crops. So, a lot of this happened as I said. So, that the whole phase of English agriculture was transformed by 1750. But what enclosure movement did was it displaced a large number of small tiny farmers who depended on the benefits from commons. I might have a cow which might graze in the commons and I might make a little money out of the milk. Now, there are no more commons, I cannot keep any cow, I am out of business like that. So, the enclosure movement constituted a huge push from the rural areas for population to get displaced and become over a period of time the urban working class. So, these are briefly some of the major economic aspects of the transformation. Let us look at the social aspects. Socially, the major thing that happened in this period was the growth of secular education. 
what do we mean when we say secular education? Right. In the Middle Ages, the church had total control over education. In fact, people like uh, St. Augustine were totally opposed to, to anybody else running educational institutions except the church. They were opposed to secular educational institutions at all. So, in this period, more and more of non-ecclesiastic educational institutions opened. Many of them funded by the state, supported by the state. Oxford and Cambridge had endowments, for instance, which enabled them to grow. Many such places across Europe. Now, this means immediately that larger and larger members, number of members of the population now acts, have access to education and quality education too. So, levels of literacy across population starts rising. We are talking of a two, three hundred year period, which is why towards the end of the period, the inventor of the printing press thought it would be a good business to start inventing a printing press because there were a lot of people who could read. So, Caxton who invented the printing press, but not just an inventor who was a very market savvy person. He saw there was a big market for anybody who printed books because people needed books, people wanted to read. Population was becoming more and more and more literate. So, secular education and its growth was a big social factor. Then, the whole of the renaissance movement which was happening at that time was a great revival of arts, literature, architecture, which is basically a consciousness expanding process. People were getting more and more exposed to things which were lying outside the rigmarole of day to day existence. Renaissance refreshed like oxygen would the soul of Europe, which is why it is called Renaissance. The great growth of art, architecture, literature and so forth. More importantly, it was during this period that Europe and the Christians rediscovered Greek philosophers. Do you remember my telling you that with the end of the Roman Empire, at the period of the end of the Roman Empire, Western Roman Empire, when the barbarians like Goths, Visigoths, Vandals and Franks swept across Roman Empire and annulled it, what little access the Western world had towards the Greek, Greek classics was lost. Romans them said, themselves had done considerable damage to the Greek classics. The Romans, it is well known, were great soldiers, great fighters. They were not great fans of art, culture, literature, philosophy. They were good at making laws. So, Roman judicial literature was great, but beyond that, it was all functional. So, where did this literature go? It went from Western Rome, Western Roman Empire to the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire running from Constantinople, remember? And from here, the Arabs picked it up. The Arabs were very keen, they were very curious, and they were big learners. So, they got all these manuscripts, got them translated into Arabic. And it is in the during the period of Renaissance that the Western man rediscovers Greek classics very often through Arabic translations. So, they discover the Greek classics, they rediscover Plato, they re rediscover Aristotle, they rediscover Heraclitus, they discover Pythagoras and all the mathematics, Euclid, everything is discovered at that time. So, it is a big, big period of transformation of culture. And as I said, this was a period when the cities were growing, population was growing, manufacturer was growing and the urban manufacturer merchant was growing into a dynamic person, large number of them. So, this becomes increasingly the character of the urban bourgeoisie, the city dweller. 
the townsmen this population grows. In fact, the word bourgeoisie is used by Marx to refer to precisely capitalists, big and small capitalists. But the original French term did not cover this big terrain. If you write, look at the writings of Alexander Dumas, have you read Dumas? D U M A S, no, you read Dumas? You heard of him. Okay, so in Dumas writings you find the word bourgeoisie being usually referred to as a, a craftsman, an artisan in towns. So the growth of urban bourgeoisie not just as artisans, craftsmen but as a townsman is a huge factor because this urban bourgeoisie becomes the source, the source of demand for all kinds of new knowledge, for all kinds of new culture. The renaissance in Europe was patronized perhaps by the noblemen, but the people who enjoyed the renaissance increasingly were the urban bourgeoisie. So the growth of modern European culture started happening with the growth of urban bourgeoisie in Europe. And finally, a major cultural product of the renaissance was humanism. Escaping from a preoccupation with one's sins, escaping from the preoccupation with the structured, structured existence governed by the church. At the same time, not really wanting to go even deeper enmeshed into another structure like another church. European population, especially of the towns, were increasingly concerned with life around them, conditions of existence which they were looking at through the use of reason, through experience, trying to comprehend makes sense. In this, in this period therefore grew up increasing tendency for people to adopt some kind of humanism as their approach to not only deal with their own day to day lives but in order to understand and make sense of the world around. A lot of the art, architecture in the renaissance period, a lot of literature had humanism as its basic quality and content marker. So these were the sociological and cultural aspects of the transformations in this period. Political. death of the Holy Roman Empire. What was the Holy Roman Empire? It is different from the Roman Empire, no? Because it is holy. The older Roman Empire which had such notables as Julius Caesar governing it was certainly not considered holy. Why? I mean given a chance the Caesars would have actually liked to call themselves gods, some of them did and got killed in the process. Could somebody tell me what Holy Roman Empire was? Empire run by church. Sorry? Empire run by church and Pope. Mm, I think the Pope would have liked that too. But it did not happen exactly like that. Popes had the ecclesiastic empire which run, which ran the church for the believers across Christendom, but they were not secular rulers. Secular rulers were the kings, the monarchs, the emperors and so forth. The Holy Roman Empire was an attempt to create a secular empire which had the authentication of the church, authentication, authentication of the church, yes. And in the process became blessed and became the arm of Christianity in the secular world.
you know that Justinian was the first Christian empire, Christian Roman king, but Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman empire. So, the idea of the Roman empire starts with Christianity becoming the state religion of the Roman empire, but it became a holy Roman empire when in France the Corlingian dynasty and its leader called Charlemagne became crowned as the first holy Roman emperor, which simply means that he is the hand of God in Europe. And the person who would interpret the will of God to him was the Pope. So, it was a tremendous attempt to marry the ecclesiastic empire with a secular empire. And the Holy Roman Emperor, Emperors continued ever afterwards. Towards the last couple of centuries, the headquarters for the em empire were not anywhere else except in Vienna. Vienna was Austria, the king of Austria was the Holy Roman Emperor. And finally, in the 16th century, the Holy Roman Empire itself ceases. And after that, the Pope rules the ecclesiastic world from Rome, but does not have any formal control over any secular empire. So, the death of the Holy Roman Empire you can see is a huge blow to existing beliefs in existing political orders. One of the largest the most significant factors lying behind the rise of the modern state was the decline and fall of the Holy Roman Empire. And the other reason why the modern state came into existence was the decline of feudalism. feudal world with its constructive, restrictive lifestyles virtually hamstrung business. All kinds of trade was taxed in a hundred different feudal centers and all kinds of local laws induced you into submission. In other words, trade, business, manufacture all got hampered under feudalism. And feudalism broke down as you already know principally because a large number of aristocrats went bankrupt. Partly because of their styles of living partly because of their preoccupations with wars, especially they are getting involved in the crusades and most importantly due to the inflation which came out of American gold flowing into Europe. So, feudalism declines and that is a big breakdown of the rural power structure happens slowly and gradually, but it happens inexorably. So, you have decline of feudalism, you have the decline of the church and the holy Roman empire and in this place there is a tremendous rise of the influence and power of the merchant manufacturer. 
increasingly the kings of Europe are involved more and more and more with merchants and manufacturers, which also means the locus of power shifts from the countryside to the towns. No? So, this is a fundamental political transformation that is happening across Europe. The fall of the, of the Catholic Church from public esteem, especially in the Germanic states, is another thing which had long far reaching political influence. We have already seen how Martin Luther for instance took the church to task for its corruption, for its improprieties and for distancing the common man from God. So, Luther introduces into common man's mind the idea that the church is not out there, the church is the body. You use this body to do the will of God and then your way to God is here now. It is not in some distant future. It is not on some day of reckoning out there in the future when you would be summoned by the Lord to rise. No, it is here now. Not just Luther, Calvin and the various variations of these movements like Anabaptists, they were all motions, uh, movements which were continuously summoning the power of reason to rationalize the organizational structure of Christian belief. At one end, Anabaptists in fact went to the extent of organizing communes. They did not even accept Luther. They said, you must own no property, everything belongs to God. You must, you must have no avarice. So, in many Germanic townships, edges of townships in rural areas, people were organized into Anabaptist communes, which became very powerful seats of Christian power of that variety. So, these people not only threatened the Catholic Church, they even threatened people like Martin Luther, who sat somewhere in the middle. Martin Luther wanted to do away with the structures of the church, so that they may be rationalized. But Anabaptists said, we do not even want the structures which Martin, Martin Luther is bringing in. So, you had this big range, then you had the Puritans. So, there was a whole range of Christians who were referred to as Protestants. And I think we have had occasion to discuss how Max Weber discovered the correlation between the ethics which was Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism as it was manifest in the moral structure of capitalist beliefs. For example, I have to do my work productively, profitably, not because I have to be profit oriented, but because the Lord has given me this calling. Being a carpenter, being a businessman, being a shopkeeper, being a man manufacturer is my calling, it is the Lord's gift to me and it is a worship of the Lord when I do this efficiently and properly. So, what happens is approach to productivity becomes extremely rich, but in a new religious fervor under Protestant ethic. I am not otherworldly anymore if I am a Protestant, I am looking at here now. Being thrifty is a good Protestant value. So, it encourages me to save, which is great because I accumulate capital which goes back into business. So, all in all, as Weber says, there is a big correlation geographically and specially across Europe between areas where Protestantism spread and areas where capitalist growth was taking place. This is the statistical correlation which Weber found, which is what made him think about the relationship between Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. All in all, when such a thing happens, 
the politics of it is very powerful. One of the important factors that led to the rise of the idea of natural rights which came after the 16th century in the 17th and 18th century increasing philosophers were talking of natural rights. The idea of natural rights was enabled by the breakaway from catholic conformism of the mind into rethinking the relationship between man and God and a pragmatic evaluation of religion in terms of your existential conditions. So, this naturally leads to the idea of not thinking in terms of a God given world at all, but subsequently people might say God let him be there, I will worship him, I revere him, but I have rights in a society such as property rights, right to speech, right to live the way I like to live. In other words, the idea of liberty, the idea of natural rights, the idea of social contract, all of these are products of the 17th century have their origin in this genesis of capitalist spirit in under the influence of protestant ethic in Europe. So, you can see the transformation in Europe. You have on the one hand substantial economic transformation, on the other hand the whole societies goes through an upheaval and finally, the political structure of Europe undergoes a fundamental change. Not just are the nation states born, but the nation states have now reordered the whole political organization of their countries. The town becomes important, the, city, the countryside loses importance, the urban bourgeoisie acquire a big voice. It is this set of forces that eventually led to increasing democratic pressures across Europe till finally in the end the urban bourgeoisie of Paris went to the point of executing their own king, but that is another story we will meet on Saturday. <laughs>